Hello and welcome back. In this video, I will continue our discussion on the topic of power in context of leadership. In my previous video, I explained to you the meaning of power. We define it as the capacity to influence others. Then I went over the French and Ravens model of the sources of managerial power. And I asked you this question. If we, for simplicity's sake, let's focus on the initial model of French and Raven that has five different factors that contribute to managerial power. I asked you to rank order these factors based on their effectiveness. Which source of power do you think would be most effective in influencing people? That was the question that I asked you. If you haven't done that rank order yet, I would like you to do that now before you proceed with the video. Rank order those uh, factors and think why you are rank ordering the way you are ordering. Why do you think a certain factor would be more effective than others? Write a couple of comments. If you approach uh, watching these videos in this interactive fashion where you are thinking and not just passively watching the entire video, you will be able to gain more from uh, the videos. That's the reason I'm giving you these tasks as uh, you are watching the video. Now I'm going to tell you which source of power is the most effective when it comes to influencing people. Now before I provide my rankings, let's take a step back and try to analyze things from a broader perspective. So we had two broad categories when it came to sources of managerial power, position power and personal power. We had four different sources of power within position power, which were reward, coercive, legitimate and information. And within personal power, we had two, which is expert power and referent power. Now, all these sources contribute to enhancing your capacity to influence people, right? So we can debate till the end of the day about which source of power is more effective. But ultimately, if you want to be an effective leader, if you want to be effective when it comes to influencing people, you want to use both, right? So the most effective approach to leading to enhancing your capacity is not to restrict yourself only to personal power or only to position power because then you are limiting yourself so when you are trying to enhance your capacity to influence people you should work on developing both your personal power as well as your position power now which source of power you will use when that would probably depend upon the situational demands. But at least you need to develop capacities from both these spheres. That's the first thing to keep in mind. If I explain this in form of a matrix, so on the x-axis we have personal power, so low at one end and high on the other end. Similarly, on the y-axis we have position power, high on top and low in the bottom. Now, if you have both low as well, low personal power as well as low position power, of course, your overall power is going to be very limited, very low. You will not have a high capacity to influence people. So that is, of course, something that you do not want. But if you are only relying, let's say, on position power, so high position power, but low personal power. Again, of course, you will be having greater capacity <clears throat> than people in this quadrant, but you will still not have the highest capacity. Same argument could also be made with respect to this quadrant, where you have high personal power but low position power. Again, your capacity to influence people is going to be limited. So you want to 
enhance both your personal power as well as position power and then you will be in this quadrant where you are successfully influencing people where you have the greatest capacity to influence people so that's the quadrant where you should target yourself to be in when i have asked this question in my classes to rank order these sources of power i get varied responses i've always got varied responses and uh, people give different reasons for why they think a certain source of power is going to be uh, most effective for example somebody would say uh, reward power is most effective and why because you know we do everything ultimately for rewards if i wasn't getting my salary uh, would i still be working no so obviously uh, reward power then is so important uh, somebody else would say no it's coercive power which is most important uh, people like hitler or um, uh, mao who were you know extremely coercive leaders uh, <clears throat> people had to follow them you know so um they had no way of saying no and that is the reason they argue that coercive power is most important if a cop stops you um you have to stop you have you know if you don't then you will be in big trouble right so people then argue that it's coercive power which is most important some argue that it is legitimate power <laughs> uh even the cop example could be related to legitimate power because it is the cop the person with the uniform and um, irrespective of whether the cop punishes you or not <clears throat> you listen to the cop right um, or somebody in who is a judge you you have to listen to the person in that court others argue that it is expert power because they have lot of respect for people who are experts and then there are those who argue that it is referent power which is most effective because they are willing to do all kinds of uh, you know sacrifices for the people whom they love whom they uh, care for which then gives them the indication that referent power is most effective right so this then makes things very confusing we can all find situations where a certain source of power is more effective than others but that's a problem with these arguments the problem is that we are not keeping all these sources of power equal in their intensity okay for example when we are talking about hitler for example we are talking about an extreme form of coercive power and we then may be comparing it with uh, your manager who is being able to reward you only with uh, say a 5% raise so these are not we are not comparing apples with apples we are comparing um, something that is of extreme intensity with something that is of lower intensity so any time that we find examples that are extreme examples then we get a convoluted notion about it being effective when in fact it may not necessarily be effective so that's the thing to keep in mind we then have to analyze things from a slightly different perspective to figure out which source of power is most effective and the way we do that is we ask this question what are the possible outcomes of any influence attempt if somebody is trying to influence you what are the possible outcomes i think you would say that either you get influenced or not and that's fair uh, so we have two possible outcomes either you get influenced or you do not get influenced that's certainly one way of seeing things in my field uh, we have found three possible outcomes actually if you delve deeper there are even more variations of those outcomes nonetheless from a broader perspective from the perspective of this uh,
class, we can think of three broad possible outcomes. One is commitment. <clears throat> so the person who is being influenced agrees to do the task that you want him to him or her to do. And he this person is now fully committed to doing it. The person um, believes in, in what you told him to do and he is ready to put his heart and soul into uh, the task. So that's what we mean by commitment. So that's one possible outcome, right? When uh, somebody tells you to do the task and you put your heart and soul to the task, that's what we mean by commitment. The second possible option is what we call compliance. In here, you still agree to do the task, but unlike commitment, you are not putting your heart and soul into it. You are doing it because you have to do it. Because if you don't, maybe you will get punished or um, it's only by doing the task will you get some reward that you are seeking. So you are only complying. You are not investing yourself fully into the task. That's what we would say is compliance. And finally, the third possible outcome is what you would say is not getting influenced and that we call it is resistance. So the person may disregard your request or in you know, more extreme cases may actively uh, even sabotage <laughs> uh, the task that you asked him to do uh, or openly revolt against you. Right. So we can find different levels of resistance, but essentially the person is not willing to do or not doing uh, what you asked him or her to do. So these are the three possible outcomes anytime somebody is trying to influence you. Now, if we compare these three possible outcomes with the sources of power, with those five sources of power that French and Raven initially talked about, how would they match up? Which source of power would be more likely be associated with commitment? Which would be more likely be associated with compliance? And which one would be more likely associated with resistance? That then will give us some indication about which source of power is more effective, right? Because when it comes to these three influence outcomes, it is clear the one that we desire the most, right? The uh, commitment is of course the most desirable. That means that you know when, when you get commitment, it means that your influence attempt was really, really successful. If you get compliance, then probably it was only moderately successful, your influence attempt. And if you're getting resistance, if the person is not willing to follow uh, or do what you want, him or her to do, then we would say that the influence attempt failed. So how would you match up the sources of power with these influence at outcomes? So this is how things line up when we compare the sources of power with the potential reactions that you will get from exercising those sources of power. So this is of course a range. It's not always definite that coercion, for instance, will always lead to resistance. No, uh, but there is a higher likelihood that coercion will lead to resistance because no one likes to be uh, threatened of punishments. Um, coercion is not something that is ple pleasant, right? So there is a higher likelihood that you may get resistance from coercion. If not uh, resistance, then maybe compliance so that we see a range here. We see a range here. Now, when if you are using reward, the probability of somebody getting resistance is slower at least in comparison to coercion. There is still a possibility that you may get resistance, especially if 
the person who is being influenced feels that you are say trying to bribe him to uh, get things done or maybe when uh, the reward is not very attractive so in those cases we may then see that the person is disregards your request legitimate power usually leads to some form of compliance because it's a person in with legitimate authority who uh, is giving the directions so you feel a need to follow this person so you may just get compliance but as you go to the personal basis of power export power and referent power the likelihood of you getting commitment increases export power there is still a likelihood that you know you may only get compliance for example when the doctor tells you uh, to change your uh, eating habits you may comply you may comply with his directions uh, even if you are not necessarily fully invested in in that uh, process uh, so <clears throat> it's an expert who is telling you to follow certain directions right uh, but on other occasions somebody else if you completely believe in what the expert is telling you you may get committed so we again see a range here but the probability of getting commitment is highest when you are exercising a referent power because people really would be willing to do uh, a lot of sacrifices for the person whom they love for the person whom they care for, for for the person whom they admire for the person whom they are attracted to so based on this analysis then we would say that the personal basis of power referent power and export power are the most uh, powerful sources of power and specifically referent power is the most uh, effective or the most powerful source of power um, so this would be the rank order uh, but of course there will be exceptions there will be times when we may get resistance even from somebody using referent power and vice versa we may sometimes also get commitment from somebody who is using coercion so this is not always definite this is not always 100 percent true but the probability so this is based more on the probability of outcomes the probabilities of getting commitment is higher when you are exercising referent power and probabilities of getting resistance is higher when you are exercising coercive power so that's the thing to keep in mind so here's some summary information of uh, what we have discussed so far effective leaders tend to have more export power and referent power it's straightforward because export power and referent power leads to higher likelihood of getting commitment or at least compliance than the position basis of power right so the effective leaders they may have legitimate power they may have reward power coercive power they tend to exercise more of their personal power than position power so it's okay to have high position power but you should use the position power a little sparingly if you use it a little too much there is a higher likelihood that you may only get compliance or even start getting resistance from people so if you want to be effective if you want to be good when it comes to influencing people when you if you want to be competent in the art of influencing people you need to start relying more on referent power and to a certain extent export power so uh, there's a lot of studies for example that has been done on bringing about change leading major change in organizations in countries uh, and you see and this is something that we will touch upon even later uh, in the semester but people who have high amounts of referent power and export power tend to be more effective in their persuasion and they are very good when it comes to bringing about 
major changes in an organization. Much more people are willing to follow them. Now, this may seem a little counterintuitive, but this is a very important point to keep in mind. Over-reliance on export power can actually lead to failure. The way I said over-reliance on position power can lead to you getting resistance. Uh, Over-reliance on export power can also be problematic. Uh, why? This is uh, a little counterintuitive, but very important information to keep in mind. So people who are experts and are relying only on their expertise to influence people, they may come across as a know-it-all kind of people. And no one likes such people who kind of knows it all. That is the reason we have such uh, words like nerd, <laughs> or somebody who is an expert in things but may not be uh, having enough of practical intelligence or may not have uh, some kind of charisma that helps you relate to the person, right? So uh, people who tend to over rely on export power usually don't become very effective leaders. Now, of course, in uh, certain setups, you have to rely on export power. Like for instance, if you are a professor, uh, you will be relying on export power because that's the only way you can impart the information and knowledge that your students need. But even then, the more effective teachers are those who are not just relying on their expertise, but are also having high amounts of referent power. Okay, so uh, keep this in mind a lot. And, you know, if you are in regular organizations, business organizations, of course, export too much of reliance on export power can backfire. Uh, people may stop liking you, and if they stop liking you, then they will not be following you. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, and again, uh, something that I have said several times, it's not that you should not use position, position power. It's not that you should not use export power. You should, but you should rely on it a little less. You should not over rely on it yet. You need to use position power moderately, but rely a lot more on referent power. And in that sequence, rely highest on referent power followed by expert power, followed by legitimate power, reward power, and coercive power. So that's what you need to keep in mind. And you also need to remember that these categorization of reward power, coercive power, legitimate power, referent power, uh, these are categories that we have created in order to understand power, in order to understand power dynamics between people, right? Uh, in real life, uh, things don't come in clear cut categories. And often those categories influence each other as well. And uh, if we were doing a you know, full semester discussion on the topic of power, I would have delved into this topic in greater detail. But, uh, at least for the purposes of this short video, uh, do realize that some of these sources of power interact with each other as well. So somebody having high position power can potentially enhance the person's personal power, right? You know, when you hear somebody is a CEO of a company, uh, you may admire, you may like that person more than if you thought that person is, um, just an administrative assistant in the company, right? Okay. Believing everything else is same. You have two photographs of one has the title CEO, other one has the title of um, sales associate. You probably will like the person who is a CEO, right? So position power can also influence personal power. And it happens also uh, through other means, a person with position power can reward people, right? If I reward you, then there is a higher likelihood that now you may start liking me. You are the person who gave me a promotion. So I may start liking you more, which in other words means that through reward, you actually enhanced your referent power, right? So 
these tend to interact with each other. Reward power can sometimes enhance referent power. So anyway, we cannot delve into too much uh, detail here, but keep at least some of these uh, distinctions in, in mind or these mechanisms in uh, mind when you are trying to apply the uh, sources of power into your own lives. I have uh, talked about leadership effectiveness in great detail. Here I'm not going to elaborate further on it, but I just want to make certain connections between leadership effectiveness and the topic of power. So people who tend to uh, use more personal power, people who tend to have higher referent power, they have a higher likelihood of uh, being more effective in terms of attainment of goals and followers affective state and also in terms of followers attitude. Uh, so they will have more positive attitude towards the leader. Uh, one more point that I want to emphasize, you, you would remember that I told you that leadership success is different from leadership effectiveness. We define leadership success as going up the hierarchy of an organization, getting promoted to higher levels in the organization. If I show this in form of a diagram, uh, the higher up you are going in an organization's hierarchy, the more position power you are gaining. Position power in terms of legitimacy, in terms of being able to reward and punish people, and even access to information. Right? So this is how you gain position power. So leadership success, even though it is technically different from leadership effectiveness, but leadership success can also help you be more effective as a leader because we know you have more power now. And of course, you should not be exercising too much of your position power, but having that capacity uh, will help you enhance your personal power as well because of the way the different sources of power interact with each other. So in summary, remember that power is good for you as well as for the organization. Uh, there's research um, that shows that you know those who are politically savvy, who seek power, seek power in terms of uh, position power, they of course tend to be more successful in their career. Uh, but there is evidence of um, those people also performing well. So what I was mentioning in the previous slide, uh, you having greater power can enhance your effectiveness as a leader as well. So your managerial performance will also increase. So uh, some of you may know, may have heard about McClellan's different types of needs. Uh, McClellan talked about need for affiliation, which is the need to uh, essentially love and be loved um, and need for achievement is to strive for excellence for achievement and need for power is essentially to gain more power seek to uh, uh, higher positions of power so people who have high need for power they tend to of course because they have high need for power they work towards uh, reaching higher positions in company and they do succeed in achieving those positions. But interestingly, they also tend to be more effective in getting the job done and accomplishing jobs. So there is evidence of power helping the organization as well, right? Uh, and uh, remember that slide that I had shown you in one of the previous um, videos about how successful managers tend to spend a lot of time networking and you know engaging in political uh, politicking kind of behaviors compared to the effective leaders and there is evidence of uh, that not necessarily being a bad thing so studies for example show that people with more political skills uh, also help achieve higher performance uh, and tend to be rated by people as more effective leaders so Power essentially is not bad. It is a good thing for you. And this last slide should convince you uh, that power is good for you and you should actually seek power. There is nothing wrong with seeking power because not having power can actually kill you. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? There is research, uh, quite a few research studies that show that people who have high position power 
tend to live longer and healthier lives. There is uh, a study that was published in 1997 in Lancet. Lancet is one of the most prestigious medical journals. Um, and in that study, they found that um, civil servants, British civil servants who were lower in the rank, okay, uh, they had a higher mortality risk. In other words, they lived uh, shorter lives. And this was after controlling for other factors like smoking, dietary habits, and physical activity. Uh, so why does this happen? This could happen because of numerous reasons, because probably when you have higher positions of power, you have more control, right? So you can get things done. Uh, if you are in, in a lower position of power, you may have the wish to get things done, but you do not have that authority to take decisions. And consequently, then you may feel helpless, you may feel stressed, which would then uh, make you sick or you know, will increase the chances of uh, your, your mortality, uh, right? And of course, the higher up you are in the hierarchy, uh, that also gives you greater access to money, uh, to other resources, which then can improve the quality of your life, which would be also beneficial for you, right? Um, Anyway, we could discuss this for a really long time and there's a lot of research here that we could delve upon, but at least this much uh, what I shared with you should be enough um, in convincing you about the importance of power. And of course, you can uh, further your knowledge on this topic through your own self-study. Thank you.